And then the second album, Idealist, comes out four years later. Mm -hmm. uh, was that also a long recording process like the first one? Yeah, it was a little shorter. I, I think we started recording like 2015. I did a one long session at a place called The Carriage House, which is in uh, Connecticut, in Stamford, Connecticut. This is with uh, Sput and Mike and Bob and Justin. Mm -hmm. and we stayed Justin there. was just on my show a couple weeks ago. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that when, we, when you were asking me uh, to come okay, on. Okay, yeah. I, I, probably, I, I probably did. I can't remember, honestly. My memory yeah. is so shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all good. Um, yeah, so it was a little bit... It was a, it was a shorter process. I, I think I started recording in 2015 and, and finished the recording in 2016 and then did all the mixing and mastering and released in 2016. Did you do the mixing yourself? No. Um, a guy, uh, Nick Hard. Mm -hmm. did the did the mixing for for idealist he did culture vulture too right wasn't that his first snarky puppy record i think so yep okay and what what is it that happens between not just i'm you know excluding the actual creational process what happens in those those four years between the albums coming out uh and and was there a lot that kind of changed your approach in terms of your writing for the second album yeah big time i i think um you know, for the first album, it was kind of a like a hodgepodge of like rock and like sort of soul stuff. Um, and I, for the second album, for Idealist, I spent a good bit of time. I think as, as is the case with probably every artist, every time you make an album, it's just this wonderful process of kind of putting your artistry and your relationship to your own musical identity through like a pressure cooker you mm -hmm. know what i mean so for the first album it's just okay i gotta write some songs okay this is cool you know this sounds like a good lyric um bring it into the band workshop it a little bit you know thankfully i i know musicians who are just fabulous and flexible and have all sorts of talents were you guys rehearsing um, ahead of time outside of the studio not a whole lot you know i mean ultimately it comes down to how much time can you ask people to spend? You know yeah. what I mean? And obviously I don't have, you know, um, record label money to be paying people for like, you know, we, a week of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So it's more kind of like, all right, come to the studio. We'll learn this stuff. We'll workshop it. And these dudes, you know, music, the kind of music that I write, which is kind of more, it's not heavy jazz fusion. You know, it's, it's, it's in the realm of, singer songwriter influenced by you know jazz and soul and rock and pop um these dudes can kind of just nail this stuff mm -hmm. within a few times. so you weren't worried about it going in you were just like we're they're gonna they're gonna kill it no matter what i wasn't worried about it going in the interesting thing is that i'm really particular though about and I everything think or certain things specifically it not everything i'm actually really loose with certain things because my I have it. My artistry is coming from who I am and what I do. So I'm definitely an improviser as a singer and even kind of in the process of producing and creating a song. But there are certain things, um, certain voicings, for example. I, I often am very specific with Justin, who's played the majority of the keyboard role in, in my band. I'm often very specific with him about on certain songs that this particular song, this type of voicing or this exact voicing is what's going to give the song its sound. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting thing to say to a jazz musician because we particularly keyboard players in the, in the realm of, of jazz look at a chord and they say, well, this chord could be all these different things. But to me, as a composer, I sometimes am that way. Certain songs of mine have that flexibility because I feel that they're coming from styles that, where that's the, the way to do it. Other songs, there's not that flexibility, you know? So what I've learned over the course of these years is that I'm not worried about whether these guys can handle it or not. I'm worried about whether they will, they will trust me and get on board with my vision. 
you ever Which, have issues with that guy saying like like look i know this is your music but you know uh, i'm a, i'm a i'm a cat too i have some ideas does that ever happen or do they just are are, are they just kind of you know full steam ahead trusting in, in what you say i mean they're definitely not full steam steam ahead trusting in what i say i mean there's <laughs> i've known these guys for too long and we've spent too many years you know exploring music together and exploring ideas and different ways to do things and i'm I think every leader who is has enough ability to really be able to hear things flexibly. And I think anyone who's studied improvised music, you know, is going to have that kind of frame of mind mm -hmm. and definitely me. Um, I, it's always a give and take in each conversation, each sort of, realm that you delve into there's always a conversation there's always some bit of explanation like you know i, I during idealist i was sort of on certain songs i had written very specific drum parts for spot are I you mean, writing these out physically or are you just kind of are you making like audio tracks for him to listen to audio audio tracks so i wasn't writing anything down on paper we this group of musicians and definitely me I'm more interested in kind of creating a demo that people could hear because I, I believe that when a musician learns something by ear the first time they really know it. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm that way to a T like I can, I could read something 30 times and then go take the music away from me. And I might be like, Oh shit, what's the next part? What's going to happen? But if right. I spent, if I do like three times through or a couple times through with the audio, it's so much easier. I mean, I think that's just more innate, you know, it gets, it goes in deeper almost. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you are literally accessing a different part of your brain. Yeah. You know, you're accessing this musical oral part of your brain where there's all these connections being made, where everything is in relation to everything else in an oral way. Mm -hmm. So if I'm learning a melody of a song, I have to know how it relates to the bass to be able to remember like kind of where the, what interval I need to be on as opposed to looking at something on a paper, piece of paper and then I just play what I see. Mm -hmm. You're using a different part of your brain. Um, anyway. <laughs> so wait, do you know going in, the like you said, the certain things with voicings are things that you get particular about. But do you know going in with your demos, like these are the parts that I'm going to be really picky about and these are the parts that I'm going to say, eh, you know, kind of take liberties with. Or is that kind of all on the spot that you're figuring this stuff out? I think... I know better now than I did, you know, four years ago or six years ago, because I sort of understand what my sound is better than I did. Um, yeah. And I, and I think when I'm writing as a writer, I definitely feel, I, I get a sense of what I do get a sense of this is important. Like this needs to be exactly this way because this is telling part of a story usually. Mm -hmm. Or this is working with, you know, this melody is is rhythmically working with this drum part, which is working with this bass part. And there's a conversation going on between those things. So that is important to me. So in that case, I know that that's part of what I'm, it's part of the process of the composition. Mm -hmm.